Su atención, por favor. Le informamos que una de las charlas será impartida en idioma inglés. Si usted requiere un equipo de interpretación, puede obtenerla fuera de este auditorio con una identificación oficial. Le repetimos. Una de las charlas será impartida en idioma inglés. Si usted requiere un equipo de traducción simultánea, puede obtenerlo afuera de este auditorio con una identificación oficial. Por su atención, gracias. students and uh, professors are connected online and the problem is that uh, they can uh, they, they, they cannot uh, ask uh, they can just listen mm -hmm. because they have no capacity for yeah, uh, yeah, I think which is a bit sometimes we uh, get um, questions by email oh, but uh, but not uh, always <coughs> Bien, eh, pues eh, muy, buenas, eh, muy buenas tardes. Eh, les agradecemos mucho el interés eh, por asistir a este simposio sobre análisis de riesgos y desastres. Y a nombre del Colegio Nacional les agradecemos eh, mucho su, su asistencia. Eh, agradecemos también la, eh, el interés de todos los que tenemos conectados en, 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 en línea. Siempre nos da mucho gusto este, que se puedan conectar a los eventos del colegio. En esta ocasión eh, tenemos eh, el gusto y el privilegio de contar con el doctor Alik Ismail Sadeh. Eh, él es el secretario general de la Unión Internacional de Geofísica y Geodesia. Es eh, profesor en el, en el Instituto Tecnológico de Karlsruhe en Alemania y del Instituto de Predicción de Temblores de la Academia de Ciencias de Rusia. El eh, doctor Alik eh, eh, tiene una trayectoria muy, muy destacada a lo largo de muchísimos años. Eh, tiene sus eh, estudios de eh, maestría y de doctorado en eh, la Academia de Ciencias de, de Rusia y eh, ha sido profesor invitado en eh, muchas universidades eh, en, de diferentes países. 
y eh, ha recibido eh, eh, por sus contribuciones científicas eh, varias de las distinciones eh, más importantes que tenemos en las diferentes sociedades, incluyendo el Premio Internacional de la Unión Geofísica Americana, de la American Geophysical Union, eh, es eh, también eh, miembro honorario, es eh, uno de los honorary fellows de la eh, eh, Royal Astronomical Society en, eh, en Inglaterra, y el doctor Ali, que eh, a lo largo de su, eh, eh, su eh, trabajo ha eh, hecho eh, múltiples contribuciones al análisis de riesgos y de desastres. Eh, como parte de los trabajos, tiene eh, varios de los eh, libros eh, editados por la editorial de, de Cambridge, de la Universidad de Cambridge, eh, sobre estos eh, temas. Y eh, en esta ocasión nos acompaña eh, y ha aceptado amablemente la invitación, cosa que le agradecemos muchísimo. Eh, por eh, la conferencia de Naciones Unidas eh, sobre riesgos eh, que se realiza cada dos años eh, y eh, en esta ocasión toca eh, que se haga aquí en México, en Cancún, durante toda esta semana. Eh, la conferencia es de hecho la conferencia internacional más grande que tenemos sobre el análisis de riesgos. Y eh, el, eh, eh, vienen eh, eh, pues muchas personas, más de 5000 mil personas a, a Cancún durante toda la semana y el doctor Ali que es parte de la organización, entonces nos da muchísimo gusto. Y eh, nos acompaña eh, también eh, la doctora Choli Pérez Campos, ella es la jefa del Servicio Sismológico Nacional a cargo de toda la red sismológica en el país es investigadora titular del Instituto de Geofísica en la Universidad, en la UNAM, y eh, la doctora eh, Pérez Campos estudió eh, Ingeniería Geofísica en, en la UNAM, en la Facultad de Ingeniería, y en la Universidad de, de Stanford. Y eh, le agradecemos muchísimo a Choli el que nos acompañe en esta, en esta ocasión. Eh, la última parte que eh, 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 quisiera mencionar es eh, eh, que el evento se hace eh, eh, junto con la Comisión de Ciencia y Tecnología de la Conferencia de Gobernadores, eh, que preside el gobernador del Estado de Colima, el eh, maestro eh, José Ignacio Peralta. Eh, la comisión eh, eh, tiene eh, poco tiempo de estar eh, este, operando y una de las eh, eh, tareas que tiene la comisión es eh, eh, apoyar y coordinar los esfuerzos de investigación en eh, áreas eh, prioritarias, incluyendo la parte de, de desastres. Y eh, nos da mucho gusto, de hecho, que el gobernador del Estado de Colima sea quien presida la comisión. Eh, Colima es eh, uno de los estados en donde eh, la protección civil es eh, extremadamente importante. Eh, el eh, gobernador eh, originalmente iba a acompañarnos el día de hoy, eh, pero eh, desafortunadamente, y ya de hecho había hecho todos los preparativos para, para venir, eh, pero eh, este, en la mañana se le complicó la agenda, no nos va a poder acompañar. Y, sin embargo, tengo entendido pues, que también nos están escuchando eh, vía eh, remota. Entonces, eh, este, sin más, eh, vamos a pasar a eh, la conferencia de eh, Ali Ismail eh, Sadeh, eh, la conferencia es en inglés, pero tenemos traducción simultánea. Todos los que quieran pueden tener eh, los eh, audífonos sin problema. And, uh, well, uh, thanks very much, and I'm sorry I made a long uh, presentation. Uh, Alik, uh, thank you. We are, uh, it's a privilege uh, having you here. And uh, I hope uh, you enjoy the stay in uh, Mexico. And on behalf of the Colegio Nacional, uh, we welcome you and we uh, and thanks very much uh, for accepting the invitation. Um, the um, uh, governor of uh, the uh, Colima State, uh, who is uh, the coordinator of the Science and Technology uh, Committee, um, uh, is uh, also sending you his uh, best uh, regards. Um, Colima is uh, uh, a state in the Western Pacific uh, coast and is uh, well known because of the Colima volcano and the earthquakes and the uh, tsunamis and the other uh, hazards. So the governor is uh, uh, well aware of the importance of uh, uh, risk analysis. And uh, 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 on uh, his uh, behalf, uh, uh, we uh, thank you. And uh, uh, we would like to, to keep in uh, contact uh, with you. Thanks uh, uh, very much, and uh, uh, please, uh, the floor is uh, yours. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, hi ma'am. Uh, it is a really great pleasure and great honor to me to be today here in the Mexico City and to deliver this uh, lecture about the disaster risk, uh, about the earthquakes, about the hazard, and most important, about the issue why sometimes earthquake hazard turn to become disaster. It is even another honor for me to start this presentation by the great words which were given recently by His Excellency Enrico Pena Nieto, President of Mexico. He told on the occasion of the global platform for disaster risk reduction, which starts in two days in Cancun, that to protect the population from natural disasters is one of the most important humanitarian responsibility. This is a task in which we should all participate, great words, and where we can all contribute. We should work together, society and government, to greater protect our community. There is actually no better words for today presentation of mine than these words which gives a stimulus to tell you what is in my opinion why sometimes earthquakes become disasters. I think uh, His Excellency Mr. Nieto was a teenager when this event shocked the Mexico and shocked the entire world. It was a really earthquake which perhaps couldn't generate disaster, but generated. And the aftermath was analyzed that the many buildings were constructed not properly in terms of the oscillation due to the peak ground a big ground acceleration, which is used in the engineering and seismological terms, and generated the buildings to collapse. More recent case, when earthquake, truly big earthquake, with a magnitude nine, generated not only issues related to earthquake, but generated tsunami, as you see, that generated fire, generated the building collapse, and finally, sorrow, which complicated by the nuclear accident. And I think this is another more recent example when earthquakes turn to become disaster. This earthquake will be analyzed for years to understand when Japan one of the most appropriate countries in terms of disaster risk reduction, couldn't manage and had a so great losses, not only humanitarian losses, but also great losses of uh, financial and economic. Before I will start truly lecture, it was a brief introduction, I would like to give a two, two more recent terms, what is a hazard and what is a disaster. Sometimes even scientists mix these terms because it's a hazard in different areas of the science defined differently. And I will show a little bit later how seismologists normally define hazard. But UN community defined hazard such a way as I presented here. It is defined as a seismic event that may cause loss of life, injury, or other health impact, property damage, loss of likelihood of services, social and economic disruptions, or environmental damage. That is what means the earthquake hazard. And disaster is a serious disruption of the functioning of community or a society involving widespread human, material, economic, and environmental losses and impacts which exceed the ability of affected communities or society to cope using their own resources. That is a definition which organization uh, of United Nations, most recently it was in February, uh, they came to uh, the declaration. This is the outline of my talk. 
I will very briefly introduce you why today weather forecasts are much better than earthquake forecasts. I will move then to the seismic hazard or associated risk and earthquake modeling and how the modeling can improve seismic hazard assessment. I would later will tell some words about the understanding of large events and the disasters which can are associated normally with the large events. However, it is not true always. It's sometimes a small events also associated with disaster, and I will discuss this as well. And finally, what are we doing for disaster risk reduction to stop earthquake to becoming true disasters? Well, uh, it was a two years ago Nature published a paper, review paper, about the 40 years forecast of weather. On the slide in the top, you see the forecast. Here it is a scale of forecast from 30% to 100. And here you see the years of forecast, starting from 81 and to the present. You see that at the beginning of this era of the forecasting, world forecasting of weather, you see that the, uh, the differences um, between the north weather forecast in the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere was a very large. And also the forecast was something in between 70 and 85%. With time, you see how wonderfully the uh, 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 forecast in two hemispheres were reduced. And what is the today particularly seen is that the for within three days, we can give a forecast something between 85, uh, sorry, 95 and 98 percent. It is really great. When I uh, prepared to visit Mexico, I looked at the, what would be weather forecast, they told mostly what I expected today to see. And the success, I just uh, grabbed the most important issues which would relate it to my presentation. What is the success really based in the weather forecast Disp uh, uh, a part of the great uh, value or vast availability of data, data and information. What is additional? It's a success in understanding of physics of meteorological processes and related processes. That is a full mathematical description. It is already about 100 years and more known the basic equation, mathematical equation, which can lead us to the forecast together with so-called data assimilation. What it means, very briefly, it means that we take the data of present day, we assimilate them to, let's say, for two weeks in the past using our model, and then we Look how our model for a cast differs from the real weather two weeks ago. And we using the scientific methodology, they may uh, trying to minimize these differences. And once we minimize, we can then propagate this information back to the two weeks and then predict the weather for another week or so and also the great success in computer science and numerical modeling. What would be great if we apply these things to earthquake science? I think the success in earthquake hazard, for example, can be achieved by enhancement in physics of forecasting, physics of earthquake forecasting. It is not only the today we know the, how the stresses generate, localize, release, but not at all scales. We need to really look into the physics of earthquake rupture, look how the small events 
can generate finally and what generates actually large event. Mathematical description of processes leading to earthquakes and extremes very important. Unfortunately, we have no today so wonderful mathematical description how which meteorologists use in their forecast. The model development and definitely we can go further. For example, the supercomputer power can allow even today there is a fault uh, uh, interaction analysis of fault interaction at the scale of 50 to 100 meters. But we need even sometimes go further to uh, smaller scales to see how small events finally bring us to the large events, which is uh, several uh, hundred kilometers in length, the rupture of the fault. And definitely more geophysical, seismological and geodetic observation we need. Once we will have it, I think we will be much closer than we are today in our forecasts. And here is a, just a citation. I will not read this all, but I would like to tell that any knowledge about this will definitely reduce the uh, losses which we experience in earthquakes or in volcano or other natural hazards. Now I would like to tell how seismologists, to the group of which I also belong, they say how we define the seismic hazard and how we assess the seismic hazard. Normally we are doing in the engineering terms, it means that it's, we are interested in what would be the peak ground acceleration, peak ground velocity which will shake the earth and the building. And then it is based on information of the features of the ground motion, etc. Today we have a two principal assessment methods. One of them it is deterministic and another is a probabilistic. What means deterministic? Deterministic means that we know sources of our earthquake and we can generate the shaking based on this knowledge and see at a particular place what would be ground acceleration or velocity. And then we can give information to engineers in the proper way. How it is, uh, uh, but definitely we cannot account all events which can occur. And in this case, probabilistic seismic hazard assessment gives the possibility to account uh, as much as possible events generated uh, in terms of the uh, probability of the occurrence. But at this moment, I should mention to you, probably many of you are not expert, that sometimes even scientists, and I will show you in the next slide, mix these two assessment tools and they are thinking about the only ground shaking. The first deterministic assessment truly gives us the value of the ground shaking, but probabilistic hazard assessment, not actually. It is different, so-called in science, different space where we are operate. It is a space of rates of probability. It's very difficult to understand to everybody. But scientists work well, however, not always, and I will show you why not always, communicate this properly to society, that society to understand as well. That is a, one of the paper published immediately after the earthquake in Tohoku, which I showed you in Japan. And the Professor Geller, he arguing that it is a map of which, which Japanese uh, government uh, approved map of seismic hazard is not true because he shows that many earthquakes here the time indicated indicated the magnitude which is a number of the uh, I mean the how how strong the earthquake and here you see different colors here also in the scale you see that zero is white and it is a dark brown is 100% of ground shaking. It means that very large, uh, the probability of ground shaking which will occur 
in this area. Why? Why this actually was published and why this scientist, seismologist, very well known seismologist, came to these things? The probability tell us about the possibility of the event to occur. When we look, when they suggest that people who not take care about the science, but looking at this map, definitely, they will tell that the area of Tokyo is really one of the dangerous area. But actually, this map tells only that with a specific period of time, with a specific probability, ground shaking will be exceeding the number which is indicated here. And yellow areas doesn't actually tell us that the big earthquake will not occur there. Just the probability is low compared to this area, which is uh, marked by black. This is uh, some, some part of the really misconduction between the scientific knowledge and the communication to, to the community, to the society. Particularly, the very well-known seismologist of the United States Geological Service tells that probabilistic seismic hazard assessment is a formalism for calculating ground motion probabilities of accidents. Great words. However, he adds another word which make danger. Great danger for me that he put all hazards. Hazard, it is a different. I just uh, de uh, determined what means truly hazard. If we will look formalism, it is correct, scientifically correct. But if the people tell us about hazard, and they, when they are feeling hazard, what means hazard? It is different issues. And here comes truly for me the, the main fallacy in terms of the earthquake disaster. No, the probability of exceedance, which is inside of the seismic hazard assessment, probabil, uh, probabilistic seismic hazard assessment, has no relation to hazard defined as an earthquake that may cause loss of lives and property. It is a formalism. It is a, some formalism which is a great in delivering information to engineering community to take action. And I will tell a little bit later more about it. But how now comes question. Okay, well, sometimes we present these maps and the black, let's say, and white are not a very well determined. Can probabilistic seismic hazard forecast the really extreme seismicity better than today? I, I believe yes. If we will use a model extreme events. Let me explain you very simple. We live in the Earth which has an age more than 4 billion years. Geological age, when we are taking and when we are considering earthquakes or volcano, is a much larger than 100 years. It is, a, let's say, 10 to 100,000 years to understand the many uh, features of the earthquake in a particular region. But when we are using our data, they are mostly comes from the knowledge of the last 100 years. In some regions, like Italy or maybe Japan and other places, there are more information about the large events which occur in the past. But it comes from the books where the mostly intensity of earthquakes are properly described, not always, but in many cases. It's very difficult, based only on the intensity, to understand the, how big earthquake war was there. But how modeling can assist? Model can generate a very large catalog, we told catalog, or we tell there is a set of earthquakes, and based on this catalog, we can really see the big events where they can occur and where they are not yet occur. And analyzing based on the probabilistic or deterministic 
uh, approaches, we can get a better knowledge about the uh, probabilities of the shaking. Uh, I will tell you today a few words about this uh, modeling, which in my group we are doing for many years. And it started uh, uh, after the work in 1990. And till today, we are working and applying this methodology in many areas uh, of the world. And how, how this model, without, without any details of the mathematical description, uh, works. It is a model of the blocks and faults. If we know the major faults in the region, we can construct such a map of the, based on the geological information and morphological and many other information, uh, geodata, satellite images, and so on, construct the map of the largest faults. La why largest? Because it's, uh, we can make it smaller as well. But it will just uh, require the more time for calculation. That's why I'm talking now about the large event. And also, large event can occur only on the rather big uh, the sections uh, of the or segments of the fault, but not at the very small fault. Uh, and this uh, modeling, driving by the geological forces uh, generated inside of the Earth generate a very big set of data. We call them catalogs, I already mentioned. And we can analyze then the special temporal correlation, clustering of earthquake, etc. But OK, well, who would be interesting? I would be definitely, after the lecture, would be happy to uh, give some references and the more knowledge about the uh, model itself. But today, I would like just to show something related to a uh, very uh, well-known area. It is a Tibet Himalayan region. And uh, the model which we developed in 2007, and this is the first model, and the model was based on the faults and uh, based on the blocks, which here you see faults, the big faults, it's the white. And uh, these were delineated by the Paul Taponier, who uh, are present here, uh, who are geologists, know this name. He is a big expert in this area specifically. And what we did, we used these fault and block models to generate the earthquakes. Here you see the distribution of the all earthquakes which were generated for 4,000 years, not just for 100, 4,000 years. And we found the areas which marked by red and blue, which experience earthquakes with magnitude higher than 7.6, 8.1. And even some area which might experience earthquakes with even large area. It's a uh, so-called uh, um, no, area which is, a, uh, as you see, perpendicular to the uh, Himalayan major thrust fault system. Using this model, but this model, just uh, I would like again mention, was published already in 2007. We had uh, no any information about this event at that time. In one year, Sichuan or Wenchuan earthquake occur with a magnitude 7.9, which shocked the uh, seismologist, Chinese seismologist, by the magnitude. However, if you see here, we it is not a prediction, but it is a, some identification of the area or recognition of the area where the large earthquake can occur. What we did actually later in the, oh, sorry, in the uh, papers which we published in 2015, we used this information to generate, the, to assess in probabilistic way seismic hazard in the region. And what we obtained we obtained this map, which show us, similar like a map I already described, the probability of the earthquake, 2% of probability of earthquake within the uh, specific period of time, exceed the peak ground acceleration. And this is a map which is used which is a part of the global seismic uh, assessment uh, uh, program. And if you will take the differences of these two maps, which is uh, based on the very long catalog of the seismic events and 
what is used by the rather smaller catalogs of event, and you see that differences is rather huge. And you see that even the differences here at the area where the Venchuan earthquake occur is rather high. Red here show 10 times more differences between the two predictions of the uh, acceleration of the ground. It means a shaking, which could generate a shaking in the area. Well, if we will look in the Venchuan earthquake itself, the uh, green, green, uh, to red colors are real shaking in the region, which is determined by a geological survey of the United States. And the black lines show the Chinese seismic, uh, the uh, ISO lines of the shaking by Chinese seismic code, by so-called global seismic hazard assessment program. And this is a result which comes from our analysis. And uh, if it's uh, seen, yeah, I see from here, I don't know from the whole, but you see that it's our shaking, it's uh, estimated, uh, uh, I mean, ground, peak ground acceleration is uh, close to 300 here. And if you will look at the real assessment, sorry, I didn't place here, but its uh, uh, assessment was between uh, 400 and 450. But for, for the, uh, in some places where uh, it was assessed for the hard rocks because it was higher for the uh, so-called soil, where the soil was uh, uh, to, uh, taken into account. And another important issue also, the many seismic hazard assessment analysis introduced the knowledge in one specific point, site event. But the important issue is when we are considering the place like the Mexico City or Tokyo or other big cities, even if the part of the city will be affected, another part, connected part, will be affected as well. That's why I think it is a most proper, not only make assessment in one point by point, but looking at so-called the multiple site assessment. And you see here, it is a just recently published paper, you see here that it's a, this is a, uh, accelerations relate to multiple assessment. And then at the point assessment, which is today used, with the number of sites, the numbers also, the, uh, the differences between them increase, and sometimes up to the uh, 2.5 and even higher times. That is another issue which seismologists should take into account. When and where does a large earthquake occur? Now a little bit different topic. And I think it is a, for century scientists searching to answer this question. One of the most important questions. And that is a photo which I made in the uh, museum in uh, uh, China. It's uh, 2,000 years as a Chinese scientist working with this, and this is uh, some equipment which tells us uh, when the earthquake comes, depending on the uh, shaking, these uh, small, small uh, uh, balls, they appear from the uh, mouth of the uh, divers here, or, uh, and there's uh, another, another uh, trap them. It's a quite interesting equipment developed uh, 2,000 years ago. But more seriously, uh, after the event which happened again in Tohoku, it was a great event with a magnitude 9 and even higher in some assessment. There is a two very well-known seismologists, Torn Lei and uh, Kanamori. They uh, published a paper telling that today we don't know exactly actually how it works, but one of the possibility is that normally we are looking at the area, here is a dark gray, which are seismic area. We know also something about a seismic region or slow so-called tsunami quakes, but there are very important areas which we, they call the conditionally stable areas, which is normally are stable, not generating earthquake. But at some conditions, that's why they're called conditionally stable. They can merge two seismic areas, developing a really very huge 
rupture. But it is not only seismological information can assist in understanding where and when large earthquake can occur. This is information comes from the oceanographers, and this is information related to the weight or to the uh, height of the tsunami waves, which arrived to the uh, Japan coast from. Uh, 800 until 1965. It was published immediately after, and one of the quarter is very good friend of mine, Russian uh, oceanographer, tsunamist, uh, uh, and he immediately sent me this uh, paper telling, look, we had this information from tsunami researcher, but it's, uh, nobody took properly into account the, how huge waves can be. Here it is a more than 30 meters waves which shaped the uh, area. Uh, and here is uh, Fukushima and Fukushima 1 and Fukushima 2. I mean, this is knowledge were available. Still not used. Another case, it is a geodesy. Today, geodesy gives a, a lot of information about the movements, about the deformation. And the paper published in 2008, based on the geodesic measurements, told that this Enriquilla fault in Haiti is currently capable of earthquake of magnitude 7.2. What happened? In two years, we know that earthquakes with magnitude only 7 create, created a great and great disaster in this country unfortunately. Another thing it is a modeling, and modeling, uh, you probably already mentioned that I love modeling. Yes, I am a mathematician at the background. That's why I love modeling. And there is a, to understand why earthquakes, it is another region of the world, and sometimes it is a, uh, uh, really brings attention of the society, especially in Europe. It is a here, it is Romania, it's so-called Vranchi region. And the all earthquakes, big earthquakes, are located at the depths of about 80 to 200 kilometers. But when they occur, the central Europe feel the earthquake, even it goes up to the uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg of the shaking, waves propagate. It's an incredible area. And it's the understanding of such earthquake, why this earthquake occurred there, helped the uh, modeling, modeling of stresses, tectonic stresses. And you can see here, highest shear stresses accumulated in the region where exactly the earthquake occurred. It is based on the rather comprehensive modeling and uh, based on the seismic tomography study. Seismic tomography study, if some people would like to understand. It is like when you have a problem in the body, you are going to the medical doctor, and they scan you, make tomography, to see the three-dimensional feature of your body. And the, similarly, the earthquake seismic tomography, the waves which comes from the earthquake from different sites give information to scientists about the, what is inside of the Earth. And based on this information, we develop this model. That is the Sumatra, another probably, you know, great earthquake which occurred in 2004 with magnitude 8.3. Was this earthquake expected in the region? The very well-known seismologist I already referred, Professor Kanamori, he told in 2005 at the Earthquake Research Institute seminar in Tokyo University, that according to my knowledge, he told, because they, they are paper, highly referred paper in 1980, uh, tells that the, such an earthquake cannot occur because of the thickness of the lithosphere and because of the velocity which, with which the uh, plate moving. It is occasionally, sometimes occur occasionally. Next seminar, was given to me at the same university, at the same uh, uh, institute. And I told, but sometimes 
We can explain this. If we will not use only these two parameters, like age of the lithosphere and the magnitude of movements of the plate, but also geometry of the region, rather complicated geometry, and direction of movement. If these four parameters are used, we can tell something about large events. And this paper was published in 2003, again one year before 2004 earthquake occurred. We showed two clusters of events where the big events can occur. And you see here it is a more, uh, let's say, seismological curve which tells about the frequency of the, uh, or number of earthquakes occur in general with the magnitude five, six, seven, eight, etc. And you see here great deviation, which at that time was not explained. And even more I can tell, this our paper was rejected from one of the well-known uh, journal because it's uh, most probably geologist who review it told that these guys prepared wonderful model, but they don't understand that earthquakes with magnitude more than nine never can occur in this region. Full stop, paper should be rejected. Okay, we managed to publish in another place, but sometimes it occur. Well, what today we have reliable, more reliable than others in predicting earthquake? When I am telling about prediction earthquakes, it is a little different from forecasting. Forecast can be based on the magnitude of event or space, or magnitude and the depths only, or magnitude and time. But the prediction is based on four very strict parameters. One, it is a magnitude, second in the space, Third is a time, and the fourth important is the probability of this event to occur. Because it's a, everybody can predict earthquake telling, today in Mexico will be earthquake and I will be winner. Because it's the earthquake in Mexico with magnitude 0 0.1 occur maybe every five seconds. But if I will tell about the exact big earthquake and so on and so on, as I just mentioned, that would be true prediction. And in this case, what we have today, it is a U.S. geological survey, the map, predicting the long-term large events. It, it shows the probability that within 30 years, the specified faults will generate earthquake with magnitude greater than 6.7. Uh, well, we should wait until... 2031 to see how well is such a prediction. Another thing which is developed by my colleague and by my teacher is an intermediate term large earthquake prediction. It was developed about 30 years ago and more by Kalis Borg and Kosobokov and it is based on the statistical analysis of earthquakes in the particular region and particularly, you see here this uh, California area and down closer to Mexico, but it's uh, mostly, mostly this uh, area were investigated here. And within each circle, there are several parameters. Again, I am not going in depth, just to give you feeling. This is uh, several indicators which are permanently traced, permanently monitored in sense of when most of them reach a specified threshold, then the algorithm which developed or method tells, oh, wait, now it is a time of the increased probability of large earthquake. And here it is the area of the time of increased probability of earthquake. Such a method gives a rather valuable results. I will show you the uh, next slide about the results. And particularly about this earthquake, some people ask, this algorithm predicted this earthquake or not? What this algorithm told, half, more than half a year 
before the earthquake. And these were communicated to 300 and more seismologists worldwide, but not to everybody. These all predictions are on the website on my Russian institute under the password, and the scientists who are interesting can send email and they can get access to see the prediction. It is not open for everybody because it's uh, everybody, I mean, public can really be, uh, you know, not comfortable seeing the some predictions. This is uh, mostly for scientists and to communicate this information to policymakers. And what was uh, more than half a year the algorithm told that within this area, the earthquake with magnitude higher than eight in July 2010, it was, occurred. And the second analysis showed that even in smaller regions, the earthquake will occur. What happened? We see that earthquake occur here. I am not going in full details. Actually, the author, Vladimir Kasabokov, never account this as prediction. You know why? Because in January, occasionally, one of the parameters I showed you of these seven indicators went a little bit down. And automatically, method told that, look, probably there is no danger. It was a two months before the great earthquake. That's why he doesn't account that as a success story. Because we should understand really and critically what happened, why this parameter went down just prior two months before the great earthquake. However, about eight months before the earthquake, it predicted the area and even localized area that in one of the red areas the great earthquake will occur. And this is a map just showing the how well up to 2008, uh, sorry, it was a published in 2011. Now we have, a, I, I needed to upgrade this one for update this one to the uh, 2015, but uh, I forgot. But anyway, it is a similar statistics. From the number of the events, total 18 events, big events, 13 were predicted. And this is a really very good for the only one algorithm. But if this analysis, statistical purely analysis, statistical seismological, could be combined with many other, like uh, electromagnetic, like uh, geodesic and other, could give a great results. And I will speak just in a few minutes. Why earthquake turned to become disaster? I will just a few things will tell about here but each of them is a great importance and uh, could be an independent lecture. What means risk? We are sometimes uh, telling risk, 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 but what it actually means, it is a, can be defined as a convolution. You know what is a convolution? It's actually not a, just a simple multiplication of three values. It is an integral form, and it is multiplication, but with a shifted a little bit spaces of each parameters. It means we are not only looking at, again in some particular point, but in surrounding area as well, so-called the integral assessment or multiplication. That's called convolution and mentioned here by this sign. Now I would like to show one excellent example published in Nature in 2013, but based on the quite different story. It was a story telling about the global earthquake models, but only one figure there in this article was uh, for me exciting. What is a, but what, now, now it is interpretation of mine. It is not a, from the paper which I mentioned here. That's just not, not mixed. It's interpretation of mine, but figure itself comes from the, uh, this, this paper. Natural scientist approach, approach of our seismological approach, to calculate seismic hazard from ground shaking. Or as I told, there is a specific methods of calculating of ground shaking. And what was done here, it is a Portugal, and was a Lisbon earthquake, I will tell about this also in a few minutes, and the Lisbon earthquake might generate such a shaking. 
That is a natural scientist approach. We calculated the ground shaking. Another approach, it is engineering approach. What engineers do, they analyze uh, uh, vulnerability of buildings. And here you see the, how the economic losses of, from the building damage will be. The third approach is the approach of social scientists. They are not taking care. That is what they're really missing. Neither of them speak properly to each other, except probably the seismologists, in this case, to uh, Earth Square or to engineers. Social science is interesting, quite different question, very important question. They are interesting. What would be ability of people to withstand of such kind of event? What is it depends on the age of these people, of their ability real to escape the building, etc., etc., and their psychological also behavior before the event and after. Very important. And that is a social scientist approach. It is a socio-economic vulnerability to disasters. Finally, integrated earthquake risk, which is used the formula on the top but might be even not a convolution, but simple multiplication. Now my question to you, to everybody, not only the scientists, which of the three first figures more closely captures the final figure? Jaime, could you tell? Engineering, I think, approach. It's just, just mimic the integrated things. And what it means, it is excellently tells that not earthquake kill us, but the improperly built buildings. Year ago, in 2010, I published paper together with my uh, postdoc, Babaev. He's from Azerbaijan. It is a place, it is a Baku, city, it is the capital city of Azerbaijan where I was born. That's why I was interested to learn where the risk in this city highest. And it was a full scenario of earthquake. In the previous figure, I showed only one. But here was a four different scenarios of earthquake. And we also convolved it using this formula, exactly this formula. We convolved of different parameters. Potential building damage, this one, this population, exposure, soil quality, landslides, occurrence, etc. And what we got for each event, for each event which might occur in this region. And if you will see, the risk is rather similar. I am not talking about the exact numbers of the losses. It would be different of the different events. But if we see that this area, central part of the old city, is most vulnerable. If any earthquake occur, first losses will be here, but not here. That's again tell us about the, if we will look very well mimic the buildings here. Scientific awareness is so important. So much we knew about this uh, port of Prince and the earthquake which occurred in the past. That was also from the publication which I already mentioned, 2008. Why this information not used by the authority to reduce disaster risk? I would like to tell a few words immediately but also public awareness and preparedness is very important. It's from the UNISDR, uh, the site. It's very simple to understand. But if we are prepared, if we know how to escape, and today I already told, it is a great that in hotels here in the Mexico City, you can find at the near each door of the hotel room information how to behave if it is fire, and how to behave if it is earthquake. That's great. That is a what, what this map tells. But we can do more. Now, very important. It was the 1st November 1755 
more than 250 years ago, when at the day of all saints, people went to the church early morning to pray to the Almighty God. And in this day, great earthquake occurred. And the many people were killed because of the falling uh, buildings. And who could escape, moved toward the sea to escape from the city by the ship, and they met the tsunami. It was a time or so-called age of enlightenment because scientists believe that we live in the best of the best world. And then it was a question, that is the best of the world? Kant, Immanuel Kant, who lived at that time in Königsberg, could observe things which today you can find in the most recent publication that the uh, water level changed because of the earthquake in Tohoku, for example. But he could observe in 250 years ago, and he published an excellent book. At that time, it was a book about 40 pages about earthquake, earthquake related to, it was called Erdbeben, I mean, the earthquake, which was uh, about this earthquake. And what he placed there, if humans are building on inflammable material, I will explain one inflammable, over a short time, the whole splendor of their edifices will be falling down by shaking. He was not telling. He even more, he told in his work, why people tell that the God sent us this disaster. No, people created this disaster. Not the God sent the disaster. Because people should know these things. And why inflammable material? Because at that time, scientists, even scientists, thought that earthquake generate fire. That's why it was a place. But the idea is build proper and you will be safe. That is an unfortunate example of what I just told. If buildings would be well prepared, we never could such a dramatic event from so small, seismologically small events like magnitude 7. In just a few months, with magnitude 8.6 earthquake occurring in Chile, but really not generated disaster. If it would be not a special case of the tsunami, it would be even no disaster. It would be scientists happy to investigate this case. That's another place of the world, uh, in uh, Iran, where also people dealing with the corruption and irresponsibility and ignorance to these things. In some cases, in some cases not. In some cases, they are really scientists especially, would like to explain governments, publish good paper, but governments don't listen to them. But this is something very important. How we really come, I will tell a little bit later. But okay, this is a developing country. Yes, they are suffering of the many problems, and they have a very limited budget. We can somehow understand the situation, but what about Italy? It is strange that this is one of the well-developed countries. It's uh, earthquakes with a small magnitude, 6.2, generated catastrophe. 300 people, almost all population of the city uh, passed away because of the event of 6.2. But that is a truly ignorance and the corruption partly. Several years ago, I uh, tried, it was, uh, was invited to give a talk at the OECD workshop, Earthquake Science and Society in Potsdam. And I was thinking about the, how to explain why scientists truly cannot deliver this information. There's many aspects, I already several uh, mentioned, but one of the aspects is economics. You know, it is so-called risk management and crisis management curve, which normally tells that after disasters starts impact of assessment, response comes, the, a lot of money uh, is released by the governments and the industry, there is a recovery, reconstruction, mitigation, comes to the prediction and preparedness time, and then another disaster, unfortunately. What I told, and in this case, it's uh, 
political, let's say, issues here or the management, disaster management issues. Another issue is seismological. The seismologists know the, how earthquake occur because of the stress generation. If no stress, there would be no any release of the stress in earthquakes, and then no earthquake, yeah? But hey, it's just. And how it occur? It occur more or less elastically, but definitely more complicated. But it is from some level of the stress. Stress is accumulated and localized in specific region until they drop down. And dropping down is an earthquake. I call this cycle seismo-illogical cycle, because after the dropping, normally stress goes down, not to zero, but to some level. But in this case, after the disaster, a lot of money released. And what happens with this money? Yeah, they are used to rebuild, and how much? Billion of dollars. And at the time when we come to the prediction and preparedness, almost zero funding comes. In many cases, in many countries, not in everywhere, definitely. And that is some type of the illogical things dealing with the financial problems of the disasters. Despite the significant progress in natural hazard research, disasters triggered by geohazard events continue to grow and impact of the uh, society and mainly due to vulnerability, as I mentioned, uh, particularly physical vulnerability, dealing with uh, and social. Social, it's, uh, we cannot ignore it. We always should convolve all uh, possible uh, knowledge uh, related to disaster. Reducing disaster risk using scientific knowledge is a foundation for sustainable development. That is a message which I would like to communicate uh, in a few days at the uh, UN uh, ISTR a global platform on disaster risk reduction. Why, despite a great progress in science and technology, I mentioned just a few examples here, but truly great, still do disasters due to natural events happen in such a catastrophic level? My answer is still because we are living in the sea of utter ignorance. What it means? It means that mostly each discipline working on the same problem, problem of disasters, but mostly independent. Seismologists work on their island, doing a great progress. Engineers and their law and policy, geodesy, psychology, social scientists, etc. But what is missing? Missing here, breaches. And these breaches will bring us to the sea of mutual understanding. If it is a proper connection between the old discipline are developed, that will be great one day when we will have integrated, truly integrated disaster risk research. Probably you see these figures, but who not, I would like to tell. That is a fantastic story. And this is a John uh, Sachs uh, uh, fable. Uh, it's based on the very uh, old Indian, the legend. Six blind men were approached and asked, could you tell us what is an elephant? And they told, show us elephant. All they were blind. The first one approached from the tail side and told, oh, look, it is just a robe. What is the elephant? Elephant is a robe. Another came to the leg and uh, they tried to understand and told, no, my friend, it is not a robe. It is a definitely is a big tree. Another one approached from the side and told, ah, guys, what you are talking? It is a wall. It is a big, big wall. Third one investigated another part, telling that it is a fan, it is a snake, it is a spike. Ah, everybody wanted to tell what they are feeling. Nobody asked, but why you are telling that it is a rope? Why you are telling that it is a wall? Nobody asked. They told, no, 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 you don't understand. It is my point is true. And finally, so often in theology, world, 
The disputant I win rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean and prate about an elephant none one of them has seen. They were blind. Sometimes we are working also in this space, unfortunately. We become blind and we tell, no, 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 look, 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 look. Seismological, I understand very well. What is that? Geodesy is still, yeah, I see this deformation. Social scientists tell us, what you are speaking about? You never, tell, uh, you never looked in the society. I don't care about your peak ground acceleration. But never comes and tells, look, look, please explain me. What means this peak ground acceleration? What means this and what means this? That is the integration which I told. We need a sea of mutual understanding. And that is the map which I look. Don't look carefully too much there. But only if we are telling about seismic hazard analysis. Today we are dealing with this parameter, seismologist. It is wrong. It is not all the analysis, assessment of hazard is inside. Without the understanding of geology and geodynamics, hydrological and electromagnetic analysis, geodesy, modeling, forecasting, earthquake physics, all comes together. Then we can tell something about the hazard. But what hazard? Hazard is just the one part of integrated analysis. Without physical, social vulnerability, resilience, exposure, etc., we never will reach the time when earthquake will stay as earthquake and will not turn to become disaster. And one of the important issues for disaster risk reduction is a transdisciplinary science. It is not only convolving scientific knowledge, but working with the policy makers at the beginning, co-designed programs together with governmental authorities. That is an important stage. Not just to develop a great knowledge and come to the uh, disaster manager or to government and to look I have a publication in best journal, Nature, Science, and, and I develop this and this, and it's a, you must appreciate my work. They definitely will tell, oh yes, professor, definitely we will go, we will try to do it. And you will close the door and they will take your Nature paper throughout. Because they have a lot of problems. You have to ask what you need to keep you, not four years, but eight years in the office. They will ask, they immediately tell, oh yes, that would be great. Tell us what we, we can help. And this kind of things can really generate the interest of the government to the problems of society in sense of the scientific knowledge. And this issue, what we just published, it is a tell that it's a, we are still working in disciplinary area or pure science area. We are trying to do in multidisciplinary area when we come together and tell, let's do for uh, understanding what is a hazard for Mexico City. And then we go back in their office where I am doing seismological part, the social scientist, social engineer, engineer science. Then once we come together and report at the conference, that is called the multidisciplinary. How much it is a helpful? Little. Definitely, it's a helpful, much better than only disciplinary case. Interdisciplinary case, it is a different. It is a when you try to understand what others are doing, what you try to feed your research to the research of others. And definitely the final one, as I already mentioned, transdisciplinarity, when you are going even further, working with the authorities, governments, to reduce disaster risk. Finally, a few slides and acknowledgement, actually, to a lot of wonderful scientists to whom it was my pleasure to work together. One of them is Jaime Urchita Fugogauche, and together with uh, uh, other colleagues, we published uh, a book in Cambridge, which uh, uh, really uh, has a lot of interest, because it's not only scientific book telling about the science, but also involves the information about from policymakers, from social scientists, and others. 
This is another report done by the International Council of Science and International Social Science Council. Also, I would like to acknowledge my very good colleagues, this Susan Cutter from the uh, South, California, uh, South uh, Carolina University. She is a, one of the uh, well-known American and world uh, scientist geographer in terms of the vulnerability analysis and uh, natural hazard and disaster. Uh, the paper which we published uh, also recently dedicated to the problems of the understanding uh, of the knowledge and this was uh, uh, another my uh, very good colleague is Irazema Alcantara Ayala and uh, most recently we published also a paper telling that we need change in term paradigm in disaster science. As I showed this was a uh, map of the pure to transdisciplinary research as a part of these uh, things. Now, finally, it is a conclusion. My dream is a world without disasters. We need strength in research and education in natural hazard and disaster risk. It is no sense from basic science of geophysical phenomena to disaster risk reduction and management. That is the only way. Integrating geophysical and geological and geodesic studies in assessing natural hazards, enhancing observations, modeling capacity, and reducing predictive uncertainties in natural hazard research. Dealing with multiple or concatenated events, hazard, which is an earthquake, volcanoes, etc., cannot be reduced. We cannot stop earthquake or volcano, but vulnerability. And hence, we need to develop a transdisciplinary link and integrated disaster risk research. Building capacity and enhancing science of education. I didn't mention this, but it's great because a young generation should be trained in transdisciplinary way, not only in poor way of science, which is definitely major they are which is what they have to get in the university, but at least at the time of the master science degree, if they would like to have, they should be trained in the transdisciplinary issue related to disaster science. Building capacity, ex ex enhancing science education, and the improving awareness of extreme natural hazard and disaster risk, promoting communication of disaster risk at all level, as I mentioned. Not only the uh, level of the local or uh, national, it should be regional and global, the all level of communication from different uh, public areas and so on. Developing link to policy makers via disaster risk assessment, what is uh, quite important. Improving preparedness and disaster risk management. Finally, uh, a few years ago, I was interviewed by the uh, correspondent of the EOS, which is the American Geophysical Union uh, newspaper, or today it's a journal. And I told him, look, I dream when my grand-grandson will be staying on the balcony of his house with his children, and he will show the children how Earth ruptures, how earthquake generates, but their building will be safe. And he will tell his children. Scientists in 21st century believe that natural events, which they call hazard, leads in many cases to tragedies in families and results in severe loss of lives and properties. They didn't know well how to minimize or, as today, to eliminate disasters. We know it in the 20th century, but we should thank them anyway that they taught about us and tried their best to reduce disaster and create a better future for us. I, with these words, I would like to thank you for your attention and thank you very much that it uh, uh, was a pleasure today to speak to you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Alec. It was a great, uh, great talk. Um, eh, muchas gracias. Y, eh, eh, antes de pasar a platicar sobre eh, la parte de, de la conferencia en Cancún y de la reunión de Naciones Unidas, eh, este, abrimos en la...
plática para eh, preguntas y eh, le agradecemos eh, muchísimo a Lick eh, por la, la presentación. Eh, si alguien tiene preguntas, por favor, eh, puede ser en español o en inglés, como sea más fácil. También si quieres preguntar. Спасибо большое, прекрасный лекция. Now in English, I did enjoy your talk, and um, I just wonder about two things. Normally, when people talk about the seismic hazard, I always see that uh, geology and paleoseismology is left like in the obscure part. And you, you discuss the time, the scales of time where, uh, where data are obtained, but I, I wonder in, if in your modeling, would you consider uh, including data from geological analysis of earthquakes and tsunamis too? Uh, Thank you very much for the question. <clears throat> Indeed, because it's a, when we are dealing modeling, we model everything based on the present knowledge coming from geology, geodesy, understanding of the frequency and energy release in earthquake in this particular region of our interest. And it is indeed we use them. It is not only the, say, what I showed based on the modeling results, but it is integrated modeling the recorded data and historical data. Definitely we integrated all three of them in the assessment which I showed and called our results. And this is indeed because it's without it, it would be just a tool for the children to play, you know, they put uh, fingers and to see how the earthquake generates. No, that's indeed the case. That's why it is the most complicated case when first we develop this model because this model should be proved. I showed you results, but it's based on the more than 40 different experiments which we did, totally different experiments, to choose a proper, a few of them, which fit the present observations, especially geo geodesy, uh, as well as a mechanism of earthquakes, which is a very important also to understand how faults work, etc. Yeah, in this case, yes, we are doing. Uh, sir, can we expect a very strong earthquake in Mexico City soon? What do you think? You know, I was asked the similar question or more or less similar question with respect to the many other places in the world. My answer is the following. We scientists don't know. But I don't stop here. I don't place the full stop. I always act exactly. We don't know exactly. We can give a lot of information, but it would be not enough to tell exactly when, with which magnitude, and where exactly the earthquake will occur. Unfortunately, today scientists cannot tell in such a deterministic way but can tell, as I already showed you, that within a large, rather large area, with a, some specific range of magnitude, with a, some specific time frame, mm -hmm. earthquake can occur with some of probability. That we can tell. But again, it is not exactly. However, it's an excellent question, because it's a, some people tell us, if the prediction of earthquake cannot give you results, why you need it? It is not true. I can tell you other very interesting case. My teacher, Professor Kalis Borak, was the first who pushed this really at the high scientific level earthquake prediction. He was a, a person who was called this uh, P, P, P word guy. And, but the point was that he told that earthquake prediction is not only important as a prediction itself, but can give information to disaster management. For example, he worked for, for the last 20 years in California, in UCLA, and he was in close contact with the Department of Water in California. 
and they used his prediction and even developed a specific methodology what to be done if there is a, some probability of earthquake in the in California region. What it means, for example, in their case, they are managing the water reservoirs. But in some cases, the water reservoirs can rupture. And if they know that the earthquake, big earthquake is occurring, they can release the water very slowly at this specific reservoir to a specific non-dangerous level. They calculate it economically. They will lose something like uh, 100 to 200 uh, thousand dollars. But if no such kind of measure within specific time period and earthquake occur, they will lose several uh, dozen billion dollars. That was a, their calculation in the Department of Water of uh, California and Department of Water in the US. And in this case, I cannot tell you. Even I will have a great knowledge about this city that when the big earthquake will occur. But the point is not when the big earthquake will occur. I think that I mentioned somehow in my lecture. But how the city is protected against of disaster. That is the most important issue, I think. Let me just give you some numbers for Mexico. Yes, please. Uh, so in Mexico, we have a record of 100,000 earthquakes recorded by the National Seismological Survey in the last 110 years, so we have a long record. Uh, from those, only 300 at magnitude above five, 81 magnitude about seven, and only three magnitude above eight. From those, two happen in the coast of Colima. So it's unfortunate that the governor is not here today to hear that, that Colima is one of the places where most likely another magnitude is, is gonna happen because we have two in the last century. Uh, we know that from the records, um, the largest is 8.2. However, from historical records and paleoseismology, we uh, know that an a magnitude 8.4 or 8.6, depending on estimations, hit the coast of um, Oaxaca to Guerrero. So that might happen. Yes. Thank you for the information. That's a very important definitely to know. Buenas tardes. Gerard, mi nombre es Gerardo Bravo. Soy, soy geólogo. Lo felicito por su ponencia, por por la manera en que la presentó y contestando a una parte a la, a la compañera este, aquí en, 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 la, en la Ciudad de México ocurrió el sismo de 85 de 8.2, 8.3 como dice la doctora y yo creo que estamos un poquito confundidos con la palabra este no, no de riesgo, sino la otra, la de, no de tampoco desastre. De, Hazard, peligro. No. Tampoco pronóstico, la otra. Predicción. Ah, predicción. Creo que aquí los mexicanos, este, cuando escuchamos la palabra predicción, es como asegurar. Yo lo entendería como una zonificación. Por ejemplo, lo que ha hecho la doctora en la en las costas de Guerrero y, y toda lo que es esa, esa zona de subducción, aclarándole aquí al doctor que los sismos se originan ahí y tenemos sismos de 4, de 5, hasta el de 8.2, pero la región más vulnerable es aquí y estamos muy retirados de la costa. Entonces, eh, allá, allá donde se originan los sismos de subducción, pueden ser de siete o de ocho y en Acapulco no pasa nada o los daños son muy pequeños. La región más vulnerable es la Ciudad de México por el tipo de suelo blando que se tiene, así como Ecatepec, parte de Coacalco. Entonces aquí es una zona muy local. Como usted decía, las escalas deben de manejarse y estudiar la geología en cada sitio porque igual en la falla de San Andrés van a ocurrir sismos de 7, de 8, de 5, de 4. No sabemos cuándo ni en dónde, pero van a ocurrir. 
Nada más es eso, no creo que eso es como una zonificación de, de dónde ocurren los sismos. Y no este, porque esa palabrita a mí no me, no me gusta en lo particular, porque el mexicano así lo siente, ¿no? Es por eso nos preguntan cuándo va a temblar. En el 85 tembló y se dijo que a los 10 años iba a venir otro temblor y realmente vino y no pasó nada porque los edificios ya estaban reestructurados. Es todo. I'm sorry, uh, I, ha I have another question, I forgot to ask, and I forgot to say my name. My name is Teresa Ramirez. One, one question that I always have, and also listening to the questions here, I wonder about, uh, if you have any insight in how to communicate science to the public and the results of, uh, of research, and, and put that in, in words that are easy to understand and also effective uh, to educate the public in terms of seismic and tsunami hazard. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the question, but it's the most complicated question which I always <laughs> receive, all, uh, but difficult to answer. However, I will try to answer you because Actually, I am somehow prepared to answer this. Communication to public should start with the understanding that what public expects from scientists to get. Communication to public should be at the language of those who are asking you the question. Not a just a telling, you know, I am a quite uh, well-known scientist and I know these things and uh, this is a probability of this event, of this space and this space and the uh, Hausdorff, etc. That, that is a something which is uh, wrong. May I give you, just uh, for relaxation, one wonderful example of another, my teacher, very famous mathematician, Gelfand. Once he was, when he was 90 years old, he was interviewed by New York Times, and the correspondent asked, Professor Gelfand, you lived 90 years and you contributed to all areas of mathematics. I think there is no mathematician living today and even for the last 100 years who could contribute to all different fields. If you will start your life. You will again start with mathematics, so complicated area of research and the knowledge. He thought, you know, may I answer you differently? I wouldn't like to answer you about this, what I will do if I will young, if I will born again, but I would like to ask you why you consider mathematics to be complicated. Mathematics is not a complicated area. It is how we communicate mathematics. Is it complicated? Just I will give you an example he mentioned to the correspondent. You know, I am from Russia, Professor Gelfand told, and I like very much St. Petersburg, the major street avenue, St. Petersburg's Nevsky Avenue. And if I would walk at Nevsky Avenue, I am a mathematician, definitely, and I see standing several drank people. He was just uh, speaking to each other very bad language, and I will approach them and I will ask them, what is the greater, guys, three over five or two over six, or, or two over three? They will tell, hey, guy, what you are talking about? But rephrase you. Make the language which they will understand. Ask them, what is better for you to, to, tonight? Three bottles of vodka for five or two bottles of vodka for three? They will immediately answer you. That is a way of communication. And that is a very important when we communicate information about earthquake, about the hazard, about the potential disaster to society. We need to make clear why you, not, why you would like to know exactly when earthquake will occur. Most important to start with your house. How your house is prepared to withdraw the earthquake with a specific shaking? What you need, which type of help you need 
to make your building more resistant. Earthquake will come, not today, not tomorrow, but it will come maybe in five years, maybe in 10 years, maybe in, even at the time when your grandson will leave or granddaughter will leave, but you are not. But it will come. But how you are prepared to withdraw with this? That is the issue of society. But for me also it's very important, not only society, but also the uh, uh, real who is responsible for disaster management. And that's I already mentioned. We have to make the clear link and, uh, between the scientific knowledge and how this knowledge can be delivered to the, those who are using this knowledge. And uh, one of the ways which I briefly mentioned, it is a definitely assessment. Assessment of the, at all levels, not only at the local level, because it's a disaster always local, but also at the national, regional level, etc. This is a very important. I don't know I answered exactly your question or not, but it is a very huge question. Needs a very in-depth analysis. But the, my feeling is the most important issue is a communication, and another important issue Definitely the uh, specific linkage developed between the science and society. Thank you. You would like to add something, maybe? Uh, I, I, actually, I had my, my question okay. that you already answered, that it's okay, that's a public, but then probably most important is authorities and policymakers because they eventually bring back to the public what they need to do. So you mentioned that, and probably one is numbers, like putting numbers on the, on the disasters, translate that to if you prevent and mitigate that you are not putting that much money in there, um, probably it will make it easier, so. Um, Okay, so, en um, español, ok, perfecto. Eh, eh, me comenta el doctor Jaime, si les puedo informar un poco sobre el Servicio Sismológico Nacional, sus funciones y cómo comunica al público lo que, lo, sus tareas. Eh, su mandato principal es reportar la sismicidad que ocurre en todo el país, eh, de todas las magnitudes, pero sobre todo informar en el momento eh, que ocurren sismos de magnitud arriba de cuatro. Cualquier sismo que ocurra en el país con estas características es informado inmediatamente. ¿Cómo lo logra? Pues con una eh, red de estaciones, eh, no solo que nos pertenecen a nosotros, que están distribuidas en todo el territorio nacional, desde Tijuana hasta Quintana Roo, sino también con datos de estaciones de otras instituciones que contribuyen con nosotros. En el momento en el que se están recibiendo los datos en el servicio, inmediatamente se está calculando una localización, una magnitud y se emite una primera estimación. Y para esto usamos lo que hoy en día es eh, lo más consultado por la sociedad, que son las redes sociales, Twitter y Facebook, eh, pero también los métodos más tradicionales como correo electrónico o recibimos las llamadas en nuestro, en nuestro centro. Eh, al mismo tiempo estamos avisando a las autoridades sobre esto, eh, las autoridades entiendan ese coordinador de protección civil, eh, nacional de protección civil, el secretario de protección civil de, de la Ciudad de México, el director del Centro Nacional de, protección de, de Prevención de Desastres y ellos son las autoridades encargadas de tomar las decisiones de qué prosigue, cuál será el protocolo de, de atención ante el posible evento. Eh, nosotros eh, tenemos varios programas. Eh, conferencias, eh, hemos tenido una, una sesión de Facebook Live tratando de llegar a la gente eh, respondiendo sus preguntas sobre los sismos en general. Eh, también ofrecemos algunos talleres y visitas guiadas en nuestro centro para que puedan saber cómo, cómo es esto de monitorear los sismos. Y bueno, además de eh de proporcionar la información y tener la los canales de comunicación con el gobierno, la sociedad, el sistema de protección civil. Eh, otra, otra de las tareas del servicio sismológico es adquirir eh, la, los datos que son usados para la parte del, de los modelos. Es eh, adquirir eh, lo, los datos sobre la sismicidad en todo, en todo el país, que es la parte básica para el modelado y los estudios eh, toda la investigación científica. ¿no? Y, eh, y la pregunta que en realidad este, ya la 
contestaron muy bien eh, Alec y, y Choli. Eh, uno desarrolla formas de comunicación dependiendo de a quién van dirigidas. Tenemos una forma de comunicación distinta a la parte del gobierno, los sistemas de protección civil y eh, la parte de la sociedad y eh, también una comunicación diferente con los colegas sismólogos y los estudiantes. Y, y de hecho, en realidad, eh, el reto es eh, eh, cómo lo hacemos más efectivo estos canales de comunicación, pero sí eh, tiene diferentes eh, niveles. Eh, it's, uh, we need to develop uh, different ways of communicating depending of uh, uh, whom we are addressing. And uh, um, we, we have a different way with the government, uh, the uh, civil protection system, and uh, even our fellow researchers and the, and the, and the students. And, uh, and I agree with you that is a very difficult question, uh, but it's a very important one in the context of uh, mitigating and reducing the, the, the risk. I hope that it's in Mexico will never have experienced another disaster. And why hope? It is not based on the just the knowledge. Because of the first slide which I showed you, with your wonderful words which President told to the country and to the, all the world, because it will be addressed at the uh, assembly uh, which will start in a few days. And that is a very important, that it's the government uh, understand that hazard and associated potential disaster should be reduced disasters. And the understanding comes only through the true cooperation between the all different stakeholders uh, dealing with the issues of disaster risk. Buenas tardes. Mi pregunta es si el cambio climático y las pruebas nucleares tienen algún efecto en la producción de sismos. Gracias. Climate change, the nuclear test. Yes, uh, um, before I will answer this question, I would like really and truly thank our translators there because of the wonderful translation. I think at least from Spanish to English it is a beautiful, and I hope that it's from English to Spanish as well. Thank you very much, you all. Yeah, there, thank you. Uh, answering your question, <clears throat> climate change uh, may affect in some areas earthquake rates. Uh, it was a, mentioned in a few papers which I saw, and it is related, for example, for the ice removing from the mountain area in Apennines, and the removing of ice can generate some trigger the, uh, for the earthquake release, but only in the area where earthquakes are, could be. Occur. I mean, climate change issues are not directly related to earthquakes. There is no direct link. But such a link through the change in the topography, which may influence the tectonic stresses, and the tectonic stress may influence the occurrence of earthquakes. With respect to the nuclear explosions, nuclear explosion I may tell, cannot generate earthquake, but can trigger earthquake again in the area if the area is prepared for. It is based not on my knowledge. It is based on the never published work by academician Andrei Sakharov, the person Nobel laureate in peace, the person who was against all the many rules at the Soviet Union at the time and was uh, really, truly uh, for the uh, stopping any exposure on the ground, etc. At the same time, he told that it's probably using of the nuclear explosion for peaceful aim 
can be can be uh, useful in sense of the triggering of the big events. And he particularly mentioned uh, when he was in jail in Gorky city, he calculated and showed his results. I have these things I am telling not, uh, it is not published unfortunately because he passed away quite soon. Uh, in one year after this he couldn't publish. But he showed that uh, to the, at the joint at that time was a Soviet American workshop with the participation of about 20 uh, members of the National Academy of Sciences and National Ac Russian Academy of Sciences. I was a young, actually, a PhD student, and I helped these old people to move the uh, slides and so on. You know, at that time, it was uh, quite complicated. It's all this transparency and so on. But I heard this wonderful talk by Andrei Sakharov. And he showed that it's, if the area, seismologists tell us that the area is ready for earthquake, he calculated how to drill to which depth the borehole, what is the equivalent rotil could be placed there, it could be very safely, in his uh, uh, sense, safely locked this borehole, and the exposure of nuclear exposure can be done there, which will trigger big event. And his calculation showed that the triggers could be something, I mean, the, the, the earthquake, large earthquake can occur something like from one month to one year. One of the professor, sitting there, I wouldn't like to give his name because he told that uh, probably it would be not good because he worked in the Los Alamos and he was a some time ago secret per person. And I, that, that's why I don't mention his name. But he told, Academician Sakharov, you know what you mentioned, we also investigated, but everything is fine. But what we found, that such kind of things depending on the region could be not from one month to one year, but could extend to more than three years. And our economists calculated the cost benefit of these things, moving of the people from one city to another city. It means they're constructing them, the infrastructure, new building, etc. and the cost if we will uh, have after the earthquake. And they told that it is economically invisible. Uh, infeasible for the uh, making. That, that is a sense. But again, this is a, something which is a based on the knowledge of one of the top, definitely, physicists in the area of the nuclear explosion, uh, but not well investigated seismologically and so on. However, such investigation was done at least in Soviet Union at that time and in the US, based on the uh, word of this professor. And uh, that's uh, something which, to your question, may the earth, uh, nuclear explosion generate earthquake. If it is done in the area where earthquakes not observed generally with a magnitude higher than four, probably uh, no any big danger of the explosion. But why explosion should be? Actually, we are now working to stop to ban any type of the explosion. And in June, I am going this, I told Jaime, to the Science and Technology Conference in Vienna, which will be dedicated specifically for the questions about the uh, treaty, uh, treaty organization uh, related uh, to the uh, ban of the testing uh, on the ground and the water explosion of the uh, nuclear bombs. Thank you. Eh, mi pregunta es, ya, la doctora ya mencionó eh, los uh, movimientos, los temblores que han ocurrido aquí en nuestro país y a mí me llama mucho la atención y me inquieta y recuerdo lo del 85, recuerdo lo del 57 y aquí es donde me hace mucho ruido que cíclicamente más o menos, esto ha venido ocurriendo en un inter de 30, 40 años. Hablo de estos dos eventos de más de siete y pico. Anteriormente, el del 57, eh, según lo que he leído, existe uno más y hubo mucho más anteriores, pero en esa magnitud. 
y me inquieta, ¿será que cíclicamente se, se podrá llevar a cabo esto? Obviamente quedó clarísimo que aquí no hay predicciones ni se puede predecir, es simplemente aquí hay algo extraño, algo curioso de ese ciclo. Esa es mi pregunta. Another fantastic question. Thank you very much for the question. And the point is that, uh, again, I am referring to my teacher who introduced in uh, seismology and geodynamics the term of the nonlinear dynamics. And uh, what means nonlinear dynamics? When we are speaking about the earthquake, for example, and tell about two events which uh, range about 30 years, uh, then we expect that in 30 years will come another event. Is it true or not? It can be true, it can be absolutely wrong. Because non-linearity, it means that it is, a, what means linearity, when you have a, everything is a, at the scale of the, uh, you know, line, let's say, very simply. That is every time you can, you, know, you could expect the, some events. But non-linearity, when you are a little bit deviating, from this line, and you don't know exactly in which way you will deviate. And in this case, the event can occur, maybe even not in 30 years, but in 20, but might occur in 200 years. Why I'm telling it is not just a simple based on the understanding of physics, but also modeling tell us. During the generation for me, uh, during the working many years in the earthquake modeling, what I observed that large events have a no very linear frequency of occurrence or the periodicity, let's say every 100 years. Sometimes scientists introduce a wrong word which they tell the frequency of occurrence or occurrence time. We understand that it is average, but the society, sometimes speaking, when we are speaking 100 years event, they do, they do consider that every 100 years this event will occur. No. This event can occur in 20 years as well. But then it can occur in 150, then occur in 200, and then it can occur again in 10, 20 years average. But when you are averaging, you will get uh, the uh, reoccurrence time, so-called, something about 100. And in this case, in this case, it's very complicated to answer your question, it will be in another 30 years the big event in Mexico or not. It can, but mm -hmm. again, it cannot because of the again deviation. If we are so good with the Earth, that's so simple everything on linear, then perhaps the answer would be positive, expecting a few years earthquake. But when we are really dealing with a very complicated Earth, which can change parameters because of the little changing in the deformation or the, in the, of the surrounding area, not even in the vicinity, but they are uh, really uh, communicating to each other, the blocks and faults and planes. It's not only, that's why another fantastic say, uh, things which was published several years ago but by seismologist uh, uh, Scholz uh, in USA, he showed the uh, aqualangist who is uh, diving and searching for a specific fish with a very big loop and they're going to the fish and the, another fish cuts his, <laughs> you know, for the leg. This picture was uh, specifically drawn when the earthquake occurred in uh, Koba at that time, but not in Tokyo. All scientists in Japan and world scientists searching for the earthquake nearby Tokyo to occur. But at that time even, it was not a before this publication, before Tohoku. But it's, uh, nobody took big attention to the issues in Tohoku. That's why comprehensive analysis of disasters are needed. When we will assess all aspects of the disaster, not only when earthquake occur, but what is the vulnerability of building, how society really expected. Because if it is even building is very good, but still 
something started to you know, collapse, young people will jump and will say, but old cannot do. That is a social vulnerability. That's why many aspects should be convolved to come to the issues of the disasters. And uh, that is my big concern. We need work together, as greatly told your president, together, all stakeholders, to come to the knowledge how to make a better life in each country and in each point of our planet. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Ah. Muy interesante la conferencia. Eh, mi eh, intervención, bueno, mi pregunta o comentario eh, sobre la idea que eh, al parecer expresó Kant en su época después del terremoto de Lisboa, diciendo que el desastre, eh, la catástrofe, tenía un origen humano no era un castigo divino ni, eh, ni el capricho de la naturaleza, digamos. Eh, es una idea que me parece interesante, pero no estaría quizás eh, tan de acuerdo. En alguna forma, eh, cuando se fundó México, los que la fundaron no sabían los problemas que tenía el subsuelo de esta ciudad. Tampoco los que fundaron eh, Porto Prince eh, como capital eh, de Haití, bueno, eh, eh, después capital de Haití, sabían que por ahí pasaba la falla. En el caso de México, bueno, no es la falla, es eh, el subsuelo. Pero también en la época de Kant, ¿cuáles eran los conocimientos que se tenían de sismología para que él pudiera decir esto? Lo que vimos en cuanto al mapa, parecía los intentos de los ciegos por describir el elefante. Los eh, ingenieros son quizás los más acertados al describir el, el elefante del eh, sismo portugués, pero hay también los sociales, que son muy importantes, y los eh, científicos puros, los eh, eh, sismologistas o, o no sé cómo llamarlos. Eh, eso, eh, bueno, eh, me imagino que es un estudio reciente, que, no, eh, que los conocimientos con los que se produjo este, este estudio no son de la época de Kant. Eh, resulta un poco difícil, bueno, eh, sabemos, eh, las soluciones parecen eh, conducidas por los hechos, un poco lo que decimos eh, México de tapar el pozo después del niño ahogado. Ahora, claro que eso es mejor que nada, eh, porque no sabemos cuándo va a suceder, aunque eh, un comentario saliendo un poco del tema es, eh, eh, si uno va al metro y ve la cantidad de gente, uno puede pensar que el desastre está ya aquí, el, el hecho de que se desarrolló una ciudad en un lugar sísmicamente peligroso, eh, no solo es la corrupción, claro, el, el, el gobierno de los virreyes era corrupto, han sido corruptos todos los que lo, lo han seguido, y eh, eh, aquí se desarrolló económica y políticamente una, una entidad enorme que no podemos eh, cambiar, eh, no se podía, eh, difícil, eh, bueno, no creo que se pudiera cambiar Porto Prince ni se puede cambiar Tokio, eh, ese sería mi comentario. Eh, gracias. I'm just going to close with some comments. Uh, probably I'm going to say it in Spanish, uh, so for everybody. Um, primero, es un gran honor estar aquí y me siento muy inspirada por toda tu presentación y, y las palabras. Y me gustó mucho que pusieras esa primera lámina con lo que dijo el señor presidente, porque menciona que todos debemos participar y todos debemos colaborar. Y ahora eh, toca 
digo, uno trabaja desde el punto de vista científico, pero toca también ponerse el gorro, el ponerse en el papel de ciudadano. Como ciudadano, ¿qué estoy haciendo para mi propia protección? Y creo que eso es muy importante, que como ciudadanos asumamos esa responsabilidad también. Muchas gracias. Bien, eh, bien eh, por el tiempo vamos a tener ya que este, eh, culminar el, el evento. Les agradecemos mucho las, eh, las preguntas. El, el, los últimos comentarios son muy interesantes porque ilustran, de hecho, eh, la complejidad que se tiene, los diferentes factores eh, que están involucrados, incluyendo, de, de hecho, pues eh, las la decisiones históricas, o sea, realmente eh, la fundación de la ciudad, de la fundación de muchas de las ciudades cerca de zonas sísmicamente activas, eh, fue hecha pues, eh, hace muchísimo tiempo y en otras circunstancias. ¿no? Eh, le agradecemos nuevamente eh, al doctor Alik Ismail Sadeh eh, la presentación y, eh, eh, y de, quizá valdría la pena comentar eh, su interés principal es en la parte de investigación, él trabaja en el Instituto de Predicción de Temblores en, 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 de la Academia de Ciencias de Rusia y en el Instituto Tecnológico en Karlsruhe, en Alemania, y eh, en la parte de modelado y, en, eh, bueno, de hecho, en muchos otros eh, temas. Y eh, una de las componentes interesantes del trabajo de Ali, que es eh, que eh, tiene esta componente de, eh, dedicada a la parte de que los eh, fenómenos como los temblores, sobre todo los temblores grandes, no se transformen en, en desastres eh, y eso involucra pues, toda la parte que hemos estado eh, comentando, eh, la necesidad de un trabajo multidisciplinario, transdisciplinario, en donde tengamos todas las disciplinas trabajando con el mismo objetivo de eh, no transformar un evento, en, eh, este, un temblor en un, en un desastre. Y esto requiere pues, un trabajo mucho más amplio, mucho más allá de solo la parte de, de, de investigación, trabajar con los gobiernos, con los sistemas de protección civil, con la sociedad y en la toma de decisiones. Y en este contexto, eh, eh, pues lo que tendemos en esta semana es la oportunidad de eh, trabajar en, en, de una manera mucho más muy amplia en esta… Eh, es la plataforma global eh, de Naciones Unidas eh, y eh, vamos a buscar una forma de comunicar los resultados eh, de, eh, las, eh, de los trabajos de esta semana a todos ustedes. Y eh, I, I don't really know if um, uh, Alec, do you want to say something? Uh, to I fully uh, agree. Uh, thank you very much, Jaime, for the uh, first, uh, first of all invitation here. And uh, I would like to thank all who uh, already two hours and more here in the hall and mostly listening to me. Sorry, it's uh, not you. It would be quite interesting to hear many of you as well, your concern and so on. Uh, again, uh, I think today what we have, we have a problem of disasters. And just a very short comment to the uh, last uh, uh, person who made a very wide uh, comments, that disasters are not natural. Hazards are natural. Disasters are social. Because if no people, it would be no disasters. That's why we have to work, we scientists, natural scientists, social scientists, engineers, and others, we have to work such a way to stop the disasters, to stop the people losing their life because of natural events. That is a very important, not only earthquakes, all many other events which are hydrometeorological or geological or other. Thank you very much for your attention. And again, it's a thank you for the uh, 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 Colegio Nacional and the Academy of Sciences for inviting me here and for your interest really to this issue. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias a todos ustedes.